Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. This is the podcast for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on Sunday, October 17th, 2021. The thematic first reading is Isaiah 53, 4 through 12. Semi-continuous first reading is Job 38, 1 through 7, and maybe 34 through 41. The psalm that we're looking at is Psalm 91, 9 through 16. Second reading, Hebrews 5, 1 through 10. And the gospel text, Mark 10, 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, we would like to sit on the right and the left, please. Mm-hmm. I bet you would. Jesus doesn't really say no. He says, you don't know what you're asking. You have no idea what you're I think it's a about. polite way of saying no. And it's, it's again, one of these uh, ironic juxtapositions that we've been talking about for these last four uh, Sundays with Mark in that the verses that are left out, uh, last week we had uh, Mark 10, 17 through 31. And this time we have Mark 10, 35 to 45. And the verses that are left out are verses 32 to 34. See how that works. And uh, which is the third passion prediction. So that's the other thing that in terms of context that we want to put into play here that Jesus has just now for the third time uh, revealed what it means to be the Messiah. And, uh, and yet here's the request. And yeah, so, I'm totally for adding verses this week. You want to add those verses? Yeah, because yeah, the ridiculousness of James and John yeah. request doesn't become clear unless you realize, okay, here's what it is, Jesus is just for me to be the Messiah. And therefore, here's what it means for you to follow me. Right. Say, um, how about we sit at your right and left hand? Yeah. Yeah. Which, of course, is both, um, I, th- I think it's, uh, there, there's going to be somebody, at, there's going to be men at Jesus' right and left hands, uh, which I do take, you know, I think it's okay to take that as a, the crucifixions, uh, but also just in general, for them not to understand um, what it is to follow Jesus. In Mark the three times Jesus teaches about what it is to be to Christ immediately thereafter, the disciples uh, do some kind of stupid. And in this case, it's James and John. Well, and also this, this particular passion prediction is, um, is the longest and the most detailed of the passion predictions. And uh, in verse 34, the actions that are that are named explicitly it's not just be crucified uh but uh but basically summarizing you know what's going to happen in chapters 14 15 and 16 uh, of of mock spit upon flog kill and so that's the that you know that's the other um that's the other aspect of to say that yeah that james and john's request is um inappropriate at best. <laughs> I, this is another place where I would spend a little time and set Mark into a context. And as, as the first of our four gospels is probably written around the destruction of Jerusalem, either just before or just after, that at a time when people are witnessing the, the sheer strength of the Roman military, they're witnessing uh, a civil war that's killed probably hundreds of thousands of people in Judea. They're witnessing revolutionaries who either are on the cusp of succeeding or more likely to have just seen their destruction. They've been marched off to Rome in humiliation. Christians are probably expecting Jesus to return. That at a time when the, the temptation to power and the sheer, rea- the sheer strength of, of the threat, the military threat being so obvious, you get a story like this that's essentially the just before Bartimaeus begins to culminate the central section of Mark where Jesus does his most teaching about discipleship. And Jesus says, you know, tyranny is always going to be a temptation. Uh, tyranny is always the way in which people are going to try to get to head, ahead. You know, power over is so alluring and it's not so among you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It's a different way. Sorry, they just decided to like 
chop a tree down outside my office or something like that. But well, and and in, in addition to, I mean, one of the things that really brings that to the forefront as well is how this particular pericope ends, uh, which is, you know, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that, again, that contrast between power and tyranny, and then yet Jesus, you know, the definition of Jesus' ministry is service. And which takes us all the way back to Jesus' own experience in the wilderness of being served. That's this, it's the same word, being served by God's angels, the angels of God in the wilderness, knowing what that, you know, that, that, that experience of being served himself, bringing him through this, uh, this, this experience. And then it's the same verb also that's used for the healing of uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, where she, uh, she's restored to then serve. Uh, again, the, I think the first person who really embodies what Jesus' ministry is all about. Um, and in response to um, in response to her healing, so that's the other uh, the other I think important aspect of this passage is that here we you know in one succinct verse we get a summary of what Jesus' ministry is all about, and and yet uh, and yet we still have these requests for uh, power uh, even in the face of uh, even in the face of what as you said Matt what surrounds them and what power does. I think it's. I think it's one of the most important passages in all of Mark to kind of get a sense for how the, the crucifixion is supposed to be a, a kind of the North Star for understanding of discipleship. And, you know, James and John look like absolute idiots here. And it's easy to mock them. But we can also kind of get it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've also seen them previously in this past, this part of Mark, arguing on the way about who's going to be the greatest among all of them which, you know, is what, what guys do when they get together. <laughs> um, you know, but recognizing this is not just using the 12 guys, but it's, but it's also, it's what revolutionaries do. It's what people who really believe the world's about to turn do, right? We're going to be at the forefront of this new movement. We're the vanguard of this. They're going to write songs about us, aren't they? And, and Jesus keeps saying it's about self-sacrifice. It's about being last. Service. Mm -hmm. um, and... And that's no way to run a revolution. <laughs> I mean, you can get why they're just utterly confused by all of this because the expectations are so high uh, and they should be high. They're just not met in the way they expect. So, well, I guess we're ready for Isaiah. Isaiah. Which, which makes honestly sense. kind of bugs me this week. Oh, <laughs> why is that? I worry it's like trying to interpret what Jesus means in verse 45 about giving his life as a ransom for many. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just overly sensitive to well, that's, mm -hmm. people that's who nice try there. to voice the Isaiah servant song on the mark. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the the um, they shouldn't ever be called servant songs. They never should have been called servant songs. They never were until 18. 92 they there's many passages besides the four so-called servant songs in isaiah in second isaiah that talk about the cert the silk that use the language of servant um it's not all used in one way to refer to one figure so bernhard doom who did a lot of things for us that was not one of the helpful things he ever did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the commentary on the website uh, goes to great lengths to say, hey, read this, um, read this about the exile, read this about uh, in its mm -hmm. context. Um, uh, I'm not so sure how far that gets us either uh, in terms of preaching this week. Um, it would be kind of an odd thing to preach on Isaiah by itself, I think, uh, uh, this week. So I think we're stuck with the fact that it's paired with the... Um, the market text. Oh, I agree. Indeed. More you want to say about that? Or are we ready for Job? I'm ready for Job. Ready for Job. Well, not really, but let's go to Job. I don't know if I'm ever ready for Job. Well, the Lord's about to answer out of the whirlwind. So you better get ready. I better get ready, huh? 
now. <laughs> I'm holding yeah, so last, on, holding on for dear life. Last week we had um, back in chapter 23, which uh, which is really the climax. So after the first two cycles of Job and his friends' dialogue going back and forth, Job says, "Oh, that I could just lay my case before God." And so now Yahweh answers out of the whirlwind, and and he had said, "You know, let me." I want to talk to God when wherever the deep darkness is. And God says, oh, who is this that darkens counsel? Gird up your loins like a man, and I will question you. So Job basically says, um, well, I want, to, I want to be able to put my case before God. And so God then comes and says, okay, here's how it's going to be. Um, I'll question you and you answer me. Job has given God the choice. Uh, I love the, I, by the way, that gird up your loins is a, is a great uh, Hebrew idiom. Uh, my, when I taught tennis camp back in the old days, I taught with a woman named Tracy Erickson. And when the, when the campers would complain, she would yell at them, hike up your diaper, which I think is a very good metaphorical translation of gird up your loins. It, uh, it, it, for, it, it means to uh, take the, the robes that men wore and to tuck them into your belt so that you can do vigorous action. It's a metaphor for, okay, let's go at this. And then God essentially takes Job on a tour of the universe um, in chapters, uh, really 38, all the way through the start of 42. And basically says, do you know how this was made? 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 And of course, the the answer to all of these rhetorical questions is, I didn't do it. I didn't make it. I don't know how it works. <laughs> and uh, that's the answer. Um, so I can't be held you, responsible. That's what I would add on to. What was that? And I can't be held responsible. <laughs> yeah. And God's the, the point of these. Now, we should add that um, interpreters of Job and theologians of Job uh, in all ages, have found the divine speeches um, less than perfect as an answer to Job's questions. Mm -hmm. But it, at, at the basic level is that God is saying, um, you don't know how I made the universe or how it's supposed to run. So don't assume you do. Uh, both to Job and his friends, who um, they, Job and his friends both assume that they know how the universe is supposed to be run. So this is where it's helpful uh, to uh, the famous triangle of Job, which comes from uh, a, a seminal article by, I think, Matthias Tsevet. Um, in wow. say that 10 times fast. T-S-E-V-A-T <laughs> is the last name. But um, that is, so at one essentially uh, at one corner is God is good. At another corner is Job is righteous. And at the third corner is a good God rewards the righteous and punishes the unrighteous. And you can only have two of the three corners in the book of Job. And so Job's friends say, oh, God is good. And a good God rewards the righteous. Therefore, they assume Job is unrighteous. Mm -hmm. Job throws out that God is good. I'm righteous, and I know that God is supposed to reward the righteous and, and punish the unrighteous. God essentially says, whoever said that's the way that the moral order of the universe works. There is an order. There is an order of creation, but it is you not it. that God is going to reward the righteous and punish the unrighteous. That's a hard sermon. But actually, there's, I mean, there's some comfort there. There's some comfort to know that if you, has, if you have suffered, it's not your fault necessarily. Yes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we are, we do cause our own suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have chosen to be a Minnesota Vikings fan and yes. I bring I suffering on myself. Is. I see that with you. That's a stupid there. choice to make in life. <laughs> and I've made it and I've passed that choice on to my son so that he could suffer like me. Um, but when my friend Brian's mother was dying, Brian was in seminary and his mother was dying of um, Lou Gehrig's disease. And she said to Brian, I don't know what I did that God would do this to me. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can think of is, this is an old Swede, 
The only thing I can think of is I love my kids more than I love God, which mm -hmm. is sort of saying it's your fault mm -hmm. <laughs> to the kids, mm -hmm. right? But to, for her to know, no, you didn't do anything that the world is good, but it's not perfect. There's comfort in knowing that not all suffering has an explanation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it reminds me of um, Kate, is it uh, Kate Bowler's book? Um, what is the latest book? one? Not the, the latest, latest one, but her latest yeah. one, uh, the previous one is um, Everything Happens for a Reason, for a reason and Other and Lives other... I Have Loved. Yeah. Yeah. Because when she had cancer, uh, first had cancer, the neighbor came over and told her husband, I believe everything happens for a reason. And right. he said, oh, good. Tell me why my wife is dying. Mm -hmm. And, and her latest says, book, yeah, There's No Cure out. for Being Human, which yeah. I have not read yet. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. and, and I think the subtitle is And Other Hard Truths I Need to Hear or something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, there you have it. Um, any other things to add on the divine speeches. Our colleague, Catherine Sheffer director wrote her whole dissertation on the divine speeches. Mm -hmm. I think it's called out of the whirlwind or something. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that I have always found most helpful about, about Catherine Sheffer director's work on, on this part of Job is the way it decenters humanity, right? Um, that we construe the universe to serve our needs as human beings. And part of what's going on in the speech isn't isn't a demotion necessarily, but it's saying, why did you view the universe in that way in the first place? And so, and that's partly, I think the, one of the curses of maybe just the enlightenment and just the ways in which uh, we have developed so much mastery over things that were, um, that caused so much death for so much of human history. We're still getting used to what it means to be able to extend life and what that means for being human, you know, which is a relatively new thing in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. I've got the quotation right here if you want it. Sure. So uh, Catherine Schiffer-Digger writes in her book, Out of the Whirlwind, quote, the creation theology implicit in the divine speeches is unique in the Bible in its radical non-anthropocentricity. In other biblical texts, Genesis and Psalms, humanity is the crown of creations, but in the divine speeches, humanity has almost no place except passing references. She writes, the author of the divine speeches by removing human beings from the center of the created world enlarges Job and the reader's vision of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an order, it's just not all about us. And nor should we presume that we can see it and know it. And I think that's another another connected theme when it comes to Job is our, you know, our, our uh, hubris, our expectations of how God works and a reminder of that uh, is often helpful. <laughs> Indeed. Psalm 91. Yeah, again, Clint McCann uh, mm -hmm. from a few years ago, it's always helpful. And um, Again, what we do is we have a part of Psalm 99, 91, sorry, not the entirety, um, which is the um, Eagle's Wing uh, Psalm from, uh, I just forgot his name. He was the campus musician where I went to college. Uh, Jonkis, Michael Jonkis uh, wrote about this. Uh, and so the series of, the series of promises, uh, which are hyperbolic, I think, uh, if we take them to be, I think Clint talks about this, um, if we take the promises to be at all times and all places um, applicable, then it's not true. I mean, God does not do all of these things always for everyone, but these are promises are characteristic of, the, of what happens when you know, God gets involved in one's life. Which is really important because uh, the Psalm just sounds so out of step with some of the readings right. that we offered today. And, and Clint McCann's mm -hmm. commentary helps, he helps me understand why, mm -hmm. why that is, because it is a kind of name it and claim it kind of psalm in, in, mm -hmm. in unhelpful ways. And so yeah. um, even if you're, if, you're just, if you're just chanting it, you might still want to bring it up depending upon 
where you're going with other texts, you know, if it's not your preaching focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, and if you come from a tradition that just reads or chants the song, the plain song every time, this might be, you know, replace it with the Jonkis setting uh, of this song, which was originally mm -hmm. written not as a hymn, but as a Catholic um, call and response psalmody where, where the trained cantor sings uh, the, the majority of the psalm and then the congregation only sings the chorus. Uh, it's written, that, which is why the verses are not, the stanzas of, the, of, the, of that setting are not metrically paraphrased to be easy to sing. It's because you have a professional cantor, but that's what I would do is uh, sing it uh, rather than read it. You two are uh, you two are both musicians. You are both children of pastors, so you you know a lot about church music. What is your favorite Melchizedek praise song or hymn? Because that's it. It didn't make it into the any hymnal. Um, it's are there any good Melchizedek lost, songs? Long. <laughs> um, I did. I was told there would be no questions, um, uh, no test as part of this. Uh, I think it does it does occur, but I can't remember. Uh, I don't have I just don't have my concordance of the hymnal handy. Fine. All right. Well. Well. Yeah, I mean, this is what what this is. Of course, one of the when I talk about Hebrews and um, in my preaching class, which is takes about five minutes since I have only one preaching course and I have to cover everything known to you know, the homiletical world in 12 short weeks. So, uh, but I have a lecture where, or, or not, not so much a lecture, but when I talk about uh, biblical preaching, uh, I do use Hebrews as an example of, of the ways in which we have offerings of Christology in the New Testament. And are we actually preaching the breadth of that Christology over the course of a year or the or the, over the course of our, our 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 homiletical lives, in that we all likely have a, a Christology with which we most resonate, usually attached to a gospel, and yet we have uh, we have a, a library that offers different ways of picturing who Jesus is, and and uh, this might be not the one to which you gravitate to understand or think about Jesus as the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, and yet it's here. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a way to enter into this sort of Christological world of Hebrews uh, in, in, a, in perhaps a very puzzling way, but at the same time offers, a, 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 it might offer, I think, a, a a way to think about Jesus' work and what Jesus and Jesus' ministry and what Jesus did and, and how these early authors understood or tried to understand what it, what is God up to in Jesus. Uh, so it, that's, I, in that regard, um, there should be a hymn about Melchizedek. Uh, there are a couple. I just, I, I quick looked them up. I just don't know what they are. I mean, oh. the hymns, Isaac Watts has a setting essentially oh. i think he wrote basically every psalm probably but let me ask uh, uh, let me make sure i understand this so hebrews says jesus is the perfect high priest uh, what a high priest do they offer sacrifice for their own sins as well as those for the people and therefore jesus did this by submitting and suffering do i have it right through his yeah, own submission for the, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why he's the perfect type. That's why Hebrews just keeps looping around over and over again. It's like, oh, I forgot one more thing. Forgot one more thing. <laughs> By the way, I, I, I'm sure I said this three years ago, but I'll say it again. Uh, in one of our doctoral preaching classes, uh, our friend Kenji did preach on Melchizedek in Genesis, not in Psalm 110. And this oh. is quoting Genesis. But so that's the only sermon I've ever heard on Melchizedek and probably the only one I went to. It's fun stuff. I mean, you can get, you can, you can uh, deal with this text without having to take people too deeply into Genesis 14, which is <laughs> correct, which is fine. You have to do this notion of learning obedience through what he suffered. Uh, having been made perfect, complete is probably a better translation than perfect there. But uh, some of that needs to be parsed, I think, in some settings about what does that mean to learn obedience through suffering? Uh, and, and what that what that 
just how you're going to deal with some of these parts of Hebrews that are that are troublesome, especially when it talks about discipline or paideia later on, and seems to imply that God sends that for our own good or for our own growth. Um, so, yeah, I do think if you are working with Hebrews this week, you've got to go pretty deep into verses seven through nine, seven through 10, and, mm-hmm. and talk about that. I, I think what it's saying, I don't think Hebrews is saying that that Jesus' suffering was redemptive. This is a larger argument I think we'd have to have, but I, I do think what Hebrews is saying is, and I don't think Jesus is, that Hebrews is saying that, that somehow the, the, um, like the pouring out of Jesus' own blood somehow calms God's wrath down. But Hebrews is seeing something about the death of Jesus as the point where sin is forgiven, where sin is dealt with, mm-hmm. um, and, and that's important. But that's a, it's a bigger thing to talk about. Hebrews takes us so deep into, at least gets us knocking on the door at some of these questions of substitutionary atonement, questions about supersessionism, uh, some really big questions that, um, that I think will require some correction as well as, as, as part of your proclamation. And, and also what obedience, be- oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just helpful with that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and also what obedience means and how is that connected to then um, having been made perfect. Um, but that obedience, you know, if we think of having been made perfect in the, in the you know, the um, Greek of uh, going to completion or, you know, brought to its intended goal, that the, that's the, I think that could be a helpful connection as well, is that obedience is connected to um, this, this intention of God in the end. 